morning. My name is Tim Bunchman. I'm a professor and director of pediatric nephrology at Children's Hospital Richmond. It's an honor to be at this meeting, and I'd like to thank the organizers for allowing me to attend, or at least attend virtually, as we say. I've been assigned the task to talk about specifically pediatric dialysis in special populations. From a disclosure point of view, uh, un unfortunately, I have no nothing to disclose, uh, except I'm happily married with lots of children and grandchildren. I'm going to talk about modes of dialysis, especially in the area of acute dialysis. And I'm going to discuss two different forms of peritoneal dialysis, and you only thought there was one. I'm going to talk about standard PD that you know about and continuous flow PD that you need to know about. We'll talk about both standard and high flux hemodialysis, the various convection and diffusion forms of CRT, and also SLED, which is a really important mode of dialysis that you need to understand more about. I'm gonna take apart each mode and talk about some of, the, uh, some of the equipment and some of the approaches that we need to do with this. PD, you know about. PD is a standard throughout the world. You need an access, either acute, which is non-cuffed or guard cuff, which is chronic catheter. You need either manual or automated systems. Uh, in North America, at least in the United States, we have lactate-based systems. In Europe, uh, the, our, our colleagues are, have bicarbonate-based systems, and I'm envious because bicarbonate is probably preferable. You need a heater online because often these are small babies and they get cold. And they actually, in this case, as opposed to the other forms of dialysis, there is no anticoagulation necessary. This is a standard uh, Baxter-based machine uh, that has a warmer on the top. And this is the tar cartoon on the right is the slide that shows how the catheter goes into the abdomen and fills up the abdomen. PD is standard and fairly, fairly well understood. Peritoneal access, you can either do a non-cupped non access like the uh, critical care. You can either do chest tubes and feeding tubes. Aminia McCullough, our friend in South Africa, has done a great job of looking at different uh, acute non-cupped access. But most of us use cupped access as seen on the left side. And these are often single or double cup, often uh, either swan neck or non-swan neck that are placed in the pelvis. CFPD or continuous flow peritoneal dialysis is something you need to know about. Peter Norris, also at Cape Town in South Africa, has done a great job. It requires two access, an inflow and an outflow access. Solution goes in, solution comes out. You do not get diaphragmatic excursion. You do not change in hemodynamics. And actually a recent paper that's referenced here shows that you get much better clearance on CFPD than you do on standard PD. Something you should look into. Uh, many programs, we're working with uh, Toronto as well as uh, Cape Town to look at more a type of approach to use in an acute setting. This is at our website, www.pcrt.com. This is a suggestion of non-cupped dialysis access for SLED, CRT, or hemodialysis. And this is purely a suggestion with the correlation of the size of the catheter to the size of the patient. In Europe, they have six and a half and five French Duleman access, which we do not have available in the United States. Hemodialysis comes in two uh, different forms, standard and high flux. Access you know about, equipment is there's multiple machines. The nice thing about hemodialysis is there's online solution production. There's a heater online. And anticoagulation can be heparin or it can be none. And that's important to understand that one can do hemodialysis without anticoagulation. I'm old, you can tell that by the way my mustache looks. And these are machines that have been available throughout the last three or four decades of hemodialysis, most of which we now can find only in an archive. And the present machines are what you're seeing here that are primarily used across the world, either made by Fresenius or made by B. Braun or made by, uh, made by Baxter. These are common machines that have, again, online UF co uh, correlation. They have, uh, they have um, the ability to do accurate within about 1% or 2% UF control, and they actually have online sodium modeling. CRT has been around for about two and a half decades now. I was very fortunate to be at the very beginning of that. Access is noted above, just like on hemodialysis. Various machines are available. Solutions since 2000 onward are bicarbonate-based with or without calcium. We are a citrate-based program, so we use calcium-free uh, free, free solutions. Heater online, which frankly is, is usually not adequate for most patients, especially if they're small, and anticoagulation, either could be heparin, citrate, or prostacyclin. And if you're looking for protocols for anticoagulation, please refer to our website, www.pcrt.com. These are the various machines that are now uh, presently available in North America as well as in Europe. 
The one on the far uh, top left is the Prisma, which has been reflect, re replaced by the green machine called Prisma Flex. The B-Bron machine's in the middle, the next stage down the bottom. I'm sorry, the, uh, the Baxter uh, uh, Nikiasa machine down at the bottom. The next stage on the right upper part. And then the Presinius machine, which is mostly used for sled. All of them are great. All of them have problems. There is not a superior machine of one versus the other. It is what you use at bedside that you're comfortable with. The interesting thing about the machines, present the Prismaflex, before the COVID crisis, the, the smallest extracorporeal circuit in COVID, uh, the Prismaflex was 90 to 150 mils. B bronze 100 to 180 mils. Next stage is 83 to 183 mils. And the, the Kiso machine, 90 to 150. That's important because if you think about a 10 kilo child who's got an intravascular blood volume of 80 mils per kilo, that child's got eight, 800 cc's. So the next stage is right at 10%. The Nikiso and uh, Prismaflex about 12%. And the Prismaflex, which has an AN69 membrane, can be a problem with um, anaphylaxis. Please refer to a paper by Pat Brophy and colleagues, 2000, American Journal of Kidney Disease, for more reference on that. What's nice about that in Europe and now in the United States under COVID restrictions, the Prismaflex now has the HF20 set. That's a polysulfone membrane that allows for smaller children. So again, if you have an eight kilo child, intravascular blood volume of 80 cc's per kilo, you're talking about 60, uh, 640 mils. Now you're talking about 9% extracorporeal, so a blood prime can be done. So until recently, this has not have been available in the United States, but it's well published in Singapore, Australia, and a recent publish, uh, publication of pediatric nephrology in the last three weeks on the same machine uh, out of some studies in North America. What's coming down the pike, you know, is about these other small machines. One's called the Carpet DM, currently in clinical studies, and now become available by the FDA. Uh, clinical studies have been out of Italy. This is a 27 to 31 mil extracorporeal circuit. The beauty of this machine, you can use it in smaller children. The problem with the machine, the, uh, the circuit has to be changed at every 24 hour increments, and one can either do only convection or only diffusion, which frankly is not a problem except the daily. Uh, redo of the disposables becomes very expensive. In uh, Newcastle, they have the Nidus machine, which is a 14 mil X coral circuit, a really cool machine as far as I'm concerned, currently in clinical studies in the UK, uh, studies to be followed. But I think the nice thing about the nanotechnology, we're getting into better and better smaller machines, but we have a problem because we don't have better and better smaller access. So that's gonna be the future of these smaller machines that have better smaller access. SLED, commonly used outside of North America, some really nice studies out of India, our, my colleagues there, really nice studies out of Taiwan. SLED is basically a hybrid between CRT and hemodialysis. Think of CRT being 24 hours a day, think of uh, hemodialysis being three to four hours, SLED is eight to 10, so it's a hybrid. You essentially are using the Fresenius machine, which is the H series, using it for an eight to 10 hour uh, at bedside. You have online production, you've got a heater online, as anticoagulation, heparin or citrate. And SLED uh, actually is a really nice modality to be used uh, when one is, has limited resources. Here's the problem with all these therapies. And if you don't know this, you need to know this. If you're doing an extracorporeal blood prime, you need to know that blood is nasty. No matter where you are in the world, blood is nasty. It's acidotic with a pH of 6.5. It's hypocalcemic and it's got a potassium load. So be aware, if you've got a child who's got renal failure with risk of hyperkalemia, who's already hypocalcemic and already acidotic, you do a blood prime, you may cause an arrest. So make sure you tune up the patient a little bit if you can before you do a blood prime. So there's not consequences to the blood priming as you go on. Within five or 10 minutes after you start any sort of dialytic therapy, uh, that, that risk goes away. So is there a modality that shows the best? This was me when I was a newborn. Uh, I've never looked prettier in my life, as far as I'm concerned. So look at Frank Gotch's data from two decades ago that looks using the KT over B method where we're looking at adequacy of dialysis. If you remember that in thrice weekly outpatient chronic hemodialysis, which is what we're not talking about, that typically has a target KT over B of 1.2 or greater. You compare that to PD, it's in the middle. You compare that to Ronco's data at 20, 35, and 45 mils per kilo per hour. Uh, CRT is uh, better and sled somewhere in the middle. So if you're trying to deliver a dialytic dose, 
you may be able to do better with the continuous therapy or even daily hemodialysis uh, would give us a better therapy if we're going for solute clearance. So are there certain times that one modality should be used better than the other? Well, maybe, and the answer is maybe. These are two references, uh, one's out of, the, out of uh, Europe, the other one's out of India, looking at uh, recommendations of PD. And if you look at the population that's typically used PD in, it's when you have limited resources, it's in cardiac patients, and it's patients that are small, who you don't have an extracorporeal therapy on that will be adequate for patients. PD is a good modality, as modality has to be considered as a way to, call, to treat acute dialysis, acute therapies. CRT maybe is better in hemodynamic compromise in patients on a couple pressors, and patients are in hypermetabolic states, patients with sepsis. One of the things that happens with sepsis, patients get really uh, thermic. They get temperatures of 39, 40. The advantage here of CRT, which sometimes is a disadvantage, is there's a cooling effect. So in patients who have hyperthermia associated with sepsis, sometimes the ability to cool them off with an export therapy is an additive benefit. You have to be aware, though, that all your pressure agents and many of the therapies that you deliver on continuous dialysis or even intermittent dialysis can be cleared. So you need to be aware that for every benefit dialysis offers, there may be a, a, a negative. If you look at specifically two papers, Francisco Flores has a really nice study. This has been a while back that looks at 51 patients with stem cell transplant who all required a dialysis because of kidney failure a 45% survival rate with a mean fluid overload of 12.5%. It's interesting in this paper though, that if you look at CVVH, which is convection, there was a, almost a 60% survival rate. If you look at CVHD diffusion, only a 27%. This may be a uh, error based on the way it was added. It may, this is a small sample, but it does bring up the question, is convection better than diffusion on CRT? There are a recent paper by uh, the folks in Taiwan looking at SLED. These are patients with sepsis, with kidney failure, looking at with the heparin coagulation. And look at the cost. The cost of SLED is markedly less than the cost of CVH. It's about 20%. So if you've got a system where you're worrying about cost savings, which we all are, SLED may be a better modality in terms of cost savings. This is another recent paper that came out of India. This is a multi-center retrospective database looking at SLED and critically ill patients who are, who are septic. Again, lovely paper, highly recommend reading it. It was it's about three years ago and it has a lot of uh, ability. So SLED is something that most of us in North America do not use as much in probably Europe, but something we should know more about as something in our armamentarium of dialytic therapies. How about hemodialysis? Well, there is two times that probably hemodialysis is best. You, it's always better in patients who are hemodynamically stable. But how about intoxications? Patients who have overdosed on drug X or medication X, hemodialysis is your best bang for the buck in terms of clearance. And I will share with you my bias, which others will not agree with, but we're all allowed to have our biases. But in patients with hyperammonemia, with inborn air metabolism, a hemodialysis will clear your ammonia quicker than any other modality. And we know that for every moment that your ammonia is high, it has a negative impact upon your neurologic outcome. Therefore, it is, it is imperative to get the ammonia bound in a hurry, and hemodialysis can be safely done in children as small as two kilos. This is a graph I put together that compares CRT, SLED, standard or high flux hemodialysis, PD, and continuous PD, compares the blood flow rate, obviously on PD, there is no blood flow rate, the dialysate or convection, the need or non-need for systemic mechanical coagulation, thermic control, solutions, ultrafiltration control, and the data on drug clearance and nutrition clearance. These are all the things that one needs to think about at bedside when one starts on a interventional therapy. But let me now take this to cases because let's go to the practical. I'm gonna present three different cases that are patients that all of us have seen that I've taken care of. And I, wanna, I think we all need to learn from our experience. So case number one, 17 year old female who has chronic lithium, had a polypharmacy overdose, including lithium, she was found somnolent and down, a term that is used usually by EMT. She had impairment of creatinine that gives her about 30 or 40% GFR. She has liver function dysfunction. And we know that if you've got uh, drug and, uh, drugs on board, your renal function and your liver are important for clearance. She had EKG changes, compa EKG changes compatible, uh, compatible with lithium toxicity, and she needs to have removal. 
How are you going to do it? Well, hemodialysis can be done, standard high flux, convection, or charcoal hemoperfusion. Most of you have never used charcoal hemoperfusion. It's gone by the wayside. It's still available in some programs. And essentially what you're doing is you're adding a charcoal filter to a hemodialysis circuit to actually remove the toxins. The problem with charcoal, it also removes all anticoagulation, it removes calcium, removes platelet count, and, there, and there's lots of downstream side effects with charcoal. This is a recent paper by Maria Ferris, uh, one of our uh, co-directors of this program. And this is the top 10. This is not the Dave Letterman top 10, but this is the top 10 of medications that are uh, overdosed in children that actually there's data on clearance. And one needs to ask the question, what is the molecular weight? What is the VOD or volume of distribution? What is the percentage of protein bound? Obviously something like genomycin, which is relatively small, that a non-protein bound will get cleared very, very easily. Things like uh, vancomycin, which is larger, uh, get cleared less, less easily. So hemodialysis, so the optimal drug clearance is a small molecular weight, water soluble, small volume of distribution, and minimal protein binding. Uh, intoxication like alcohols can be also treated with diethylene glycol. I'm sorry, diethylene glycol and methanol can also be removed, lithium as well as salicylates. And this is a graph of a patient who actually had a uh, ethylene glycol overdose. If you look at the left side where the units uh, less uh, greater than 30 milligrams per mil is toxic, these are two different examples of patients who underwent standard, not high flux, but standard hemodialysis. And over four to six hours, the ethylene glycol clears very nicely. This is an example of vancomycin clearance. Vancomycin is roughly about 75% protein bound and roughly about 1,500 kilodaltons. Uh, one patient at a level of 180, the other patient at a level of 240. Last time I checked, these are both very high. And if you look at, this is a classic two-compartment drug. In three hours, the drug got cleared very nicely. You walk away with hemodialysis, and look what happens. Look at that rebound, because you've got the tissue and vancomycin is now going into the vascular space. Then you come back again, you've got a, 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 another clearance, rebound, another clearance. So you need to look at things like, uh, like um, uh, combination therapy, and I'll, which I'll address in a minute. This is uh, Tegretol, 80% protein bound, 250 uh, molecular weight. Patient was quite toxic. Again, we cleared the thing very nicely in a matter of about uh, three or four hours with very little rebound so the patient could be done. So hemodialysis, especially high flux hemodialysis and things that are highly protein bound to be considered for intoxications. This is another good example of sequential therapy. This is the patient, probably the patient I, did, I talked about at the beginning who had lithium overdose. We did high flux hemodialysis for first uh, three or four hours. Then we handed the lines off to CVVH. Again, CVVH will give you a lot better clearance of drugs over CVVHD. So you can use sequential therapy for bank, lithium, other drugs as a way to allow for drug clearance. So something to, to, to consider. Let me give you case number two. This is the row case, uh, 2.9 2 kilo infant, presents at 48 hours of life with lethargy. The child's afebrile, blood pressure is normal for a child, heart rate is normal for the child, respiratory rate's a little bit fast. The child was floppy, a little bit like me before my fourth cup of coffee in the morning with poor neurologic tone. This child had the following labs, normal H&H, &H, normal creatinine for mom, normal potassium, normal calcium, normal phosphorus, Bicarb is a little bit low, and yes, that ammonia was 1,533, uh, and no doubt in your lab, my lab, it was checked three times to make sure there's no error. Normal in our lab at this assay was less than 40. This is the classic presentation of a child with inborn error metabolism. So is there an optimal form of dialysis, and is there a risk of beginning the dialytic, I'm sorry, the inborn error metabolism cocktail, which is um, sodium vinyl acetate, benzoate, before you start therapy. So let's address both of those. So this is a paper that everyone talks about at every meeting on inborn error metabolism. This paper is almost as old as I am that looks at for every point in time that your ammonia is high, you start losing IQ points long-term. So it is imperative to get the ammonia down as rapidly as you can. This is a lovely diagram and, F, and uh, something I pay attention to by Stefano Pica. Stefano is a very close friend of mine who's at, uh, in Rome and now is doing outstanding work in Africa, by the way. He looks at this from his perspective. Media medical therapy, response, no response, medical therapy with dialysis. That's really the question one needs to have to follow. 
So this is Pika's protocol that I follow because he's he's the guru in this area. You limit or stop the protein. You make sure they've got plenty of calories on board, even if they have to use insulin. You load them with arginine. This is the proper dose. You load them with carnitine. This is the proper dose. You give B12, biotin, and you go ahead and load them with both spinzoate as well as phenylate. Um, now, I, the question I've asked multiple people, is, do you need to wait for a diagnosis? And the answer is you do not need to wait for the diagnosis because in our lab and other labs, it's a send out. We may not have the definitive diagnosis for three to four days. So we go ahead and start this therapy pending a diagnosis because there's limited risk for that. So going back to our child, um, this child was electrically intubated because we're gonna start doing lots of things to this child. We placed a Foley in. It is a bias that I have with no data to support that, but it's no bias that I have that these kids are polyuric. And the last thing you want is have a child who's on dialysis to be dry, that's gonna work against you. And we went ahead and loaded this child with phenylacetate, benzoate, arginine, uh, carnitine, and sent off the appropriate urine and plasma organic and amino acids. A seven French, 10, 10, uh, 10, French, uh, 10 centimeter catheter is placed in the, in the uh, subclavian. Uh, think about this, this is a 2.9 kilo child. That means about four centimeters of this line was in this child and about six centimeters child was hanging out this child. Unfortunately, the, the, in the United States, that's the smallest catheter we have, although Medcoff now makes a seven centimeter length, but these are still seven French catheters. We started this child on blood flow rate of 70 mils per minute. That is roughly about 22 mils per kilo per minute. And you're gonna say that's awfully fast. And I'm gonna say, thank you. There's no risk of going fast. This is not an osmolar effect. Therefore, you need to bring the, the uh, ammonia down quickly. Therefore, you need to bring out a very strong, a very aggressive dialytic therapy. The dialysate flow rate is about a half liter per minute uh, with physiologic potassium and uh, phosphorus. Remember, this is not a kidney failure patient. This is the patient who has problems with hyperammonemia. So you have to give potassium phosphorus in the bath or to the patient. Otherwise, they'll have complications with dialysis. And then we drew ammonia levels every hour. Here's what happened. In literally three hours, this child's ammonia went from 1,533 down to 200. That's pretty cool. That is pretty cool. And that's actually a big deal. So the question is, is this gonna stay? The old days before we had CRT, we would walk away and see what the rebound is. But in this case, we actually wound up handing the, machine, handing the lines over to CRT system. Now, let me explain something that was, that was suggested by our nursing staff, because they're usually smarter than I am. We had to do a blood prime on hemodialysis because this child's only got an intravascular blood prime at 240 mils. Our, our circuit was about 65 mils on hemodialysis. So because of that, you don't get the blood back at the end. So what we did is we took the blood from the hemodialysis machine, and by the way, don't tell blood bank you do this, and then we put it into the hemofiltration machine. So we used the blood that was already pH normal, and we were able to go back on, therefore minimizing our risk of blood exposure to the patient. This is what happened to the same child. You notice at two or three hours, we handed off from hemodialysis to hemofiltration. We went on for another 19 hours. The child came off and the child did well. So in less than 24 hours, we had we went from 19, 1,533 down to roughly about 100 uh, on the ammonia. So remember that ammonia is not osmolar, so you can dialyze the socks off people. And you do need to keep the patients wet because every hemodialysis machine will take off roughly about 100 mils per hour of fluid, even if the UF is set at zero. Please understand what I just said. Hemodialysis machines take off roughly 100 mils an hour even if the UF is at zero. So you need to get that fluid back. And therefore, that's why you want to have this child intubated. That's why you want this child to have a Foley in. So if you look at dialytic comparison, again, this is data from PICA. Uh, hemodialysis is superior to any other modality. And how about the drug clearance? Did we clear the drug? Well, I went back and took the samples, which was kind of fun to do, sent it to Mendel Tuckman up at DC Children's. And if you look at the dark blue, it's the ammonia, the reddish, it's the phenyl, uh, sodium phenyl acetate, and the bright blue, that's the benzoate. The left two are uh, pre-filtered and post-filtered hemodialysis. The right two are pre-filtered, post-filtered hemofiltration. Yes, we did clear drugs, but also we cleared ammonia. So my question to Mendel was, did we clear drugs as a detriment of having the levels too low on, uh, for the patient? And he's, his response was, he doesn't know what the right levels are. But in this case, the patient did fine, so we're okay. 
Let me give you the last uh, case, which is actually the most cruel case I've ever dealt with. It was a patient a couple of years ago, a 15 year old girl, 71 kilos, who presented with new onset diabetes. She had oliguric kidney failure, pulmonary edema, and hyperkalemia. Um, I'm married to an intensivist, so I like to talk about vent settings. She was intubated with 70% up out of 2 pipa 10, and her labs are a bit concerning. Her case seven, six and a half. She's hypernatremic, her B1's 90, her glucose is 13 is 1300. Her urine output is diuretic, non-responsive, and inadequate. And remember, she's in pulmonary edema and hyperkalemia. She needs renal replacement therapy. But what is her risk factors? I want you to drill in on this. This is a very important case that teaches a lot about osmolar effects. She has hyperkalemia and pulmonary edema. She has osms that are measured. So think about the osmolar formula, two times the sodium, B1 over 2.8, I use three because I'm lazy, glucose over 18, I use 20 because I'm lazy. She has a measured, a measured osmolality of 488. And as you know, that's about 200 osms above physiologic. And we know that across any membrane, if you bring down that osms in a hurry, they're gonna have all sorts of neurologic devastation. So this is really, really important question. So what is the osmolality of hemodialysis solutions? What is the osmolality of PD solutions? What is the osmolality of CRT solutions? And is there a better form to have and should you be efficient or not, not efficient? What you need to know is that hemodialysis uh, osmolality is about 285. And PD goes anywhere from about 300 to about 340. And CRT is about 285. Hemodialysis is your bigger gun, biggest gun, very efficient. PD less efficient, CRT, you can make it as less efficient, more efficient. What you want in this case is a very inefficient system that's gonna clear K first, clear fluid second, with minimal impact upon the sodium, I'm sorry about the osmolality. So those of you who know the Star Trek maneuver, the Kobayashi's Maru, we actually changed the conditions of the test. The Kobayashi Maru in Star Trek is that uh, Captain Kirk went in and to reprogram the machine so he can uh, not die in a war. So what we did is we added in sodium to our dilatic solutions on CRT. We added in 60 milliequivalents of sodium to give our CRT solution a 200 sodium bath. That's 400 osms. That's 400 osms. So now we have a less of a gap between the patient with serum osmolality, a patient with dilatic osmolality, we actually, the patient was given insulin, so the K came down with that. And over about five days, if you notice this graph, we actually changed the patient's osmolality in the bath. Every 12 hours, we came down with sodium in the bath, and over about five days, we brought down the patient's osmolality. Uh, this was a cool thing to do. The residents were excited because they now knew how to uh, calculate osmolality again and again and again. Uh, but in the case, this was one way to take care of this patient. You cannot do this on hemodialysis and you cannot do this on PD. CRT is the only mode you can do this on. So in a very short time, I've gone through lots of data on, on renal replacement therapy. And I would tell you right now, there's two things you need to know. There's no data that exists on outcome of kidney failure that based on the optimal uh, therapy. So you, if you're good at PD, do PD. If you're good at CRT, do CRT. If you're good at hemo, do hemo. If you're good at sled, do sled. You do what you do well. You need to know about the other modalities, but you do what you do well. And the other one is I want to dissuade a myth that is uh, urban legend. Hemodialysis can be done in small infants. You just have to understand the risk of blood prime. You have to understand that the machines itself have an automatic UF that's significant and you need to control that. But it can be done at bedside, but you need to have a lot of attention to detail. With that, with that I'm gonna leave you. I appreciate your time. And I look forward to seeing you after COVID so we can all work together as colleagues. Thank you. These are, I'm sorry, let me add you one more thing. There's two websites I want you to know about. Uh, one is the, our website, which is PCRT, which we're morphing into a, a new website called Iconic. But if you don't know about XTRIP, look at that website. This is an international group of nephrologists, intensivists, toxicologists. They're getting their hands around all the drugs that are overdosed in people to see if there's a better way to clear those. These are my two different uh, uh, email addresses. If I can help in any way, please reach out to me. Thanks for your time, guys. Look forward to seeing you in the future.